Tonight we're going to be talking about bone loss. If you've been diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia, or if you've been told because you have a family history of bone loss that you should be extra concerned, or if you're, maybe you're taking certain types of medications for other conditions, maybe you have hypothyroidism or blood pressure problems or cardiovascular disease, and your doctors have said you're at increased risk for bone loss, this is a show you're not gonna to wanna to miss. Now, when we talk about bone loss, there are a lot of factors in terms of what causes it. And the factors are not, I mean, although calcium plays an important role, most doctors, when, when they diagnose you with bone loss, are gonna to wanna to tell you to go take calcium, and that's about the end of the nutritional guidance that you're gonna get. But in reality, there are a lot of factors that are associated with bone loss, and these are just a handful of some of the more common ones. So you can see here, lack of physical activity, number one at the top of the list. There is a law um, called Wolf's Law, And this basically means that bone grows based on pressure. Pressure is what physical activity is. So if you move your body and you put your muscles and your bones under pressure through exercise, and weight bearing is definitely better than non-weight bearing, then you can actually increase the physiology behind why your body wants to increase your bone density. So lack of physical activity is a big one. Excessive exercise can also be a problem. Now, you know, here we are talking about exercise, so you have to know where to draw the line. For many of you, uh, exercise is done or should be being done to tolerance. And so um, some of you might be, you know, heavy, heavy exercisers where you get into a situation where you're working out multiple times a week, you're not taking enough time off, you're not getting adequate downtime or rest or sleep. This can actually contribute to chronic inflammation that leads to bone loss. So there's a nice balance, just like everything else in the world, too much is a bad thing, too little is a bad thing. You've gotta find that magic spot right in the middle. Chronic inflammation. Now, we're gonna go a little bit more in depth about this because I believe that chronic inflammation is the cause of bone loss, period, no matter who you are, no matter what the situation. We also know that being a woman, being a woman predominantly because women have less muscle mass in general, women are, are less capable of being physical. Now, please don't take offense at that. There are some of you women out there that are super strong and can exercise and maybe you're CrossFitters or maybe you're competitive athletes. I'm not saying as a general rule that all women uh, are at risk, but the vast majority of women are. Then we have things like smoking and alcohol use, of course, lifestyle factors that cause what? They cause chronic inflammation. And then we have a history of bone fractures. Now this is less of a risk factor per se um, if you've had a, like a trauma. So if trauma was what you experienced as a fracture, that is not, you shouldn't count yourself in that category of risk. We're talking about spontaneous fracture. I had uh, a patient not very long ago who had compression fractures in her spine and they were spontaneous, meaning she didn't, there was no car accident, there was no major injury, this was just spontaneous. And so uh, if you have ever had a spontaneous fracture, historically speaking, you're definitely at much greater risk uh, of future fractures and, and of bone loss. And the chronic medication use, we're gonna talk more in depth about which medicines you wanna look out for here in just a minute. Family history of osteoporosis. Now this is less important. Um, again, there's a caveat to this one. So if you have a 90 plus year old grandma who was diagnosed with osteoporosis, that's not what we're really talking about. We're talking about you have somebody in your family, your immediate family, who maybe they were diagnosed uh, with bone loss in their 40s or 50s or even maybe even earlier. This is a kind of more of an early onset. Traditionally speaking, osteoporosis, true osteoporosis, is really a, a, a disease, progressive disease of the elderly, of the very elderly, not of younger folks. So if you have family history of that older crowd, not so much an issue, it's of the younger folks in your family. And then frequent pregnancies. Again, true of ladies too, being a woman, so these two kind of hand in hand because men can't be pregnant despite what many people are trying to say nowadays. But frequent pregnancies because of the nutrition, right? When you have and you're growing a baby inside of you, this requires vast amounts of nutrients, many of these nutrients which help aid bone maintenance. And so as you are 
pregnant multiple times, very important to monitor nutrition to reverse uh, any kind of malnutrition that might occur during pregnancy uh, or during breastfeeding as well, but also to maintain healthy, uh, healthy bone. And this ties into nutritional deficiencies because you know vitamin and mineral deficiencies, not just calcium, right? Calcium is important, but it's not just calcium. Your bone is made by a variety of different nutrients. And, um, and so you, this is important, if you, especially if you are worried about bone loss, it's important to have that checked. It's important to have that measured. And then we have lack of sunshine, and this has a lot to do with vitamin D. Vitamin D is, is how we make vitamin D is through sunshine exposure. There's a cholesterol on your skin that gets converted into vitamin D when you're exposed to UV light. And so that vitamin D is very, very important. One of the things vitamin D does is it improves or increases the absorption of calcium. So if you uh, don't get adequate vitamin D, you'll actually become calcium deficient over time. So these are some of the main factors behind why people could potentially develop bone loss. But let's go a little bit deeper. Um, let's check out this diagram. So what is a very kind of typical scenario in most people's lives, right, is everything that you see here, which we start with up here with number one, which is poor nutrition. A lot of people don't eat well, okay? Eating out fast food, junk food, high doses of carbohydrates, especially processed carbs and processed seed oils, um, grains, glutens, this is poor nutrition, right? And then we couple that with lack of physical activity. How many of you have a job that's super physical? Now, there may be some of you out there that do, but most people nowadays don't have a physical job. They have a sedentary job. And that leads to, we said a minute ago, Wolf's Law, which is, which is the law of pressure on bone. And when you're sitting all day in a chair, there's no pressure on your bones or joints. That lack of physical activity is going to lead to deterioration in your overall uh, bone and your muscle. And then we have unhealthy eating habits. So this kind of ties into poor nutrition. Um, but poor, let me back up a minute because I mentioned fast food and junk food here. But poor nutrition could also be that you're eating wrong for, your, for who you are. Um, you know, in other words, you, you could be... You could be eating what you think is a good diet, but not getting adequate nutrients from the diet that you're eating, or the diet that you're eating might not be right for you. And an example of, of this would be um, gluten. There are a lot of people with gluten sensitivity, and as I'll show you here in a moment, um, gluten is a major contributor, or can be, to bone loss. Um, and, and another example of this might be somebody who's following a vegan diet and they're doing it for health purposes, but that vegan diet, because of the low quality of protein typically found in a vegan diet, there's a poor nutrition outcome in that regard. Now, um, again, there are a number of different examples as far as like poor nutrition, not getting adequate quantities of nutrients from the diet that you're eating or maybe eating the wrong diet. It's not right for you as a unique person. These are all things that can be identified, by the way, with the right kinds of doctors and testing. Um, and also, you know, paying attention and listening to yourself and listening to your body and, and, uh, and, and just being tuned in to how you feel when you eat, all important. Then we have things like alcohol, right? So we got, let's move down the list here. So, you know, a lot of people will gravitate to alcohol. Of course, alcohol is a driving force behind nutrition deficiency. So alcohol can cause vitamin B deficiency. Alcohol can also contribute to things like magnesium and zinc deficiency. Alcohol is a poison uh, in a sense. And so if you're doing this on the regular, if you're drinking on a regular basis, this is going to be a problem for you when you add up the years. We mentioned before sedentary job. And then, you know, kind of the combination, one of the things that happens, you know, if we follow this through uh, all the way, right? So we've got poor nutrition, lack of physical activity, unhealthy eating habits. We throw out a little alcohol and stress. We have a sedentary type of job. Now, because of all these things, we hurt. We hurt. We have chronic inflammation. And generally, where does pain show up first? Usually it shows up in things like muscles or joints. We get a little bit of joint ache or joint pain, a little stiffness, um, that type of thing. And then a lot of us gravitate toward pain medicines. And of course, pain medicines can also 
cause deficiencies of things like vitamin C and B vitamins and iron. And so, you know, now we're multiplying, you know, potentially the problem because these nutrient deficiencies can also cause pain, right? And so now through all this, we also start seeing bone loss. Why? Because nutritional deficit leads to bone loss. And then what does the doctor do for bone loss? Generally, they want to give more meds, right? So at the end of the day, depending on which meds you get, these meds cause additional nutritional deficiencies. So we go back to poor nutrition here, right? So this just becomes a cycle that becomes self-feeding. So how do we intercept, right? We evaluate ourselves. We answer, we answer ourselves honestly and say, am I doing my part to improve bone health or am I wrecking myself by having all of these factors working against me? And only you can answer that question. You just have to be honest with yourself about it. Now, I mentioned before about gluten, and I, and I posed the question about gluten. Gluten, can it cause bone loss? And I think it's important to show you uh, a little bit of information. Being the guy who knows a lot about gluten and being relatively, I'll say, famous for, for gluten sensitivity, I want you, I want you to look at this uh, study published here recently. Osteoporosis can be the sole presentation in celiac disease, meaning you could be celiac, have no gut symptoms, have no diarrhea, no intestinal pain or discomfort, but osteoporosis or bone loss might be the way your celiac manifests. That's what this is discussing and referring to. So you can see here, celiac disease, an autoimmune condition causing gluten intolerance and disrupted absorption of nutrients predisposes to osteoporosis. The release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, calcium malabsorption, and the activation of osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are cells that break bone down, represent the main mechanisms responsible for bone derangement. Hence, it's important for physicians to consider screening for celiac disease panels in patients representing with osteoporotic features with no clear etiology. So if you go to your doctor and there's no reason why you should be osteoporotic, you're generally relatively healthy, your doctor should consider measuring you for a gluten issue. That's what this, these researchers are saying about gluten and osteoporosis. Now beyond that, we know gluten causes vitamin and mineral deficiencies, many of which contribute to, um, to bone health, right? So when you're lacking nutrients that are necessary for your bone to remodel and your bone to grow and maintain itself, you're gonna end up with poor quality bone over time. So it's very important to understand gluten-induced malnutrition is a major driver of this. Now there's also gluten-induced inflammation. And I wanna introduce you maybe to a new topic. There's a, there's a term in science that has been introduced uh, more recently and that is a term called osteoimmunology. And what does that mean? This is a new field of science where you have bone, osteo means bone and immunology means immune system, where you have the, the discovery that bone is broken down as a result of chronic inflammation, right? So when we look, think about gluten, gluten causes chronic inflammation. So you can see your bone loss triggered by the cytokine network of inflammatory autoimmune diseases. So what autoimmune diseases are linked to bone loss? Well, celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis. There's, there's a host of pre-existing autoimmune conditions that we know the inflammation that's driving those diseases is also driving an osteoimmunological bone loss. And so what I'm showing you here, there's just that correlation in the research, right? So that these researchers are saying that, look, chronic inflammation leads to a host of different cytokine releases, okay, that increase bone erosion, okay, and decrease bone formation. That's what this fancy diagram is basically saying with all these complex terms, right? We don't have to get into that, but it's important for you to understand that chronic inflammation increases bone erosion and reduces bone formation, thus net bone loss over time, leading to disease like 
osteoporosis, and this is inflammatory. Now, how do you know whether you have the inflammation? One of the really great tests that you can ask your doctor to run, and insurance covers it, is high sensitivity C reactive protein. This is a protein released by your liver that's a good indicator of whether or not you have chronic systemic inflammation. So if you go in and you have a positive CRP, any, and what, what's positive is anything higher than 0.9, okay? Anything higher than 0.9 is gonna be considered too much, too high. It's a marker for systemic inflammation. That's gonna increase the potential risk for you to develop bone loss through that inflammatory pathway. What can you do about it? Figure out what's causing the inflammation in the first place. We don't take any inflammatories. A lot of doctors wanna just put people on any inflammatories you know, and, and damn the cost of the anti-inflammatory. But what I will show you in just a minute is if you do that, you're gonna end up in worse shape